All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, If you would take your Bibles, open them up to Galatians chapter 3, verse 26, and we're going to be working through to chapter 4, verse 7 this morning. I'm just going to go ahead and jump right into it because we got a big chunk of text to work through this morning. I hope you brought your Bibles because I don't know if you notice, I usually preach from the Bible, and... um, It's helpful to be able to follow along and see where I'm at, especially if I refer back to other references, things like that. So make sure you bring your Bibles with you on Sunday morning because it's usually what I'm preaching from. All right, 326 through 47. Here's what the Bible says. For in Christ Jesus you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ... There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to promise. I mean that the heir, as long as he is a child, is no different from a slave, though he is the owner of everything. But he is under guardians and managers until the date set by his father. In the same way, we also, when we were children, were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son, and if a son, then an heir through God. There's a lot in those verses. As I was reading and studying for today, I was just thinking, man, there's probably eight or nine sermons packed into this this passage, this unit of thought that Paul has here. But um, the thing that really jumped out at me was how Paul talks about being adopted into God's family. If you look right there in, uh, in verses 26 and 27, you'll see where Paul says, For in Christ Jesus you are all sons of God through faith. Now stop and think about that for just a second. Think about those implications. What does that mean? We're sons of God through faith. That's, that sounds pretty big, right? Um, and he says that because of, of our salvation, we are now in Christ. Now, you remember last week we talked about the law kind of as this uh, harsh teacher, guardian, um, maybe even like a, a drill sergeant, um, and Paul said we are no longer under that guardian. Well, the reason we're no longer under that guardian, the reason why we don't have to face the condemnation of the law, why we don't have to... Uh, endure the, uh, the harshness of it is because we've been adopted into God's family. It's because Jesus saved us from that condemnation. Now, this is why uh, the Galatians' retreat into legalism uh, was not only wrong theologically, but it just really made no sense. Think about it for a second. You've been adopted into God's family. What does Paul say? He says, in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God. You get to be a part of God's family. You've got all these great benefits of being a part of God's family. And the Galatians are saying, I like being a part of God's family, but I like these legalistic principles too. So I want to have it both ways. God's family is not quite good enough. I want to have this legalism as well. So that's why this is just... So why Paul is, is so adamant about this, why he keeps driving this home that legalism is such a big problem because he says, look what you have in Christ and look what you're trying to go back to in legalism. Condemnation and death in legalism, life and peace and happiness and joy in Christ. Why in the world would they do that? So that's why Paul keeps driving this point home. And then if you look on in verse, uh, in verse 27, You see an interesting example that Paul gives. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. 
So Paul's talking about uh, becoming a member of God's family, adoption into God's family, and then he gives this example of baptism. Well, that's because the ordinance of baptism is one of the best pictures of being adopted into God's family that we have. Uh, I think sometimes with, as Baptists, sometimes we kind of lose sight of the significance of baptism, which is ironic considering that's our name. But baptism is more than just a hoop that you have to jump through to join the church and, and sit in on two-hour uh, business meeting. I mean, it's, it's more than that. Uh, it, it's more than just that thing that you do after you walk an aisle. It's a lot more than that. What Paul says is, is baptism is actually a command of, G, of Jesus, and it paints a beautiful picture of the redemption story. When a Christian is baptized, they are completely submerged under the baptismal waters. This represents Christ dying and casting off the condemnation of the law. And so just like when Christ died, he took the law, the curse of the law, upon himself and destroyed it, so baptism represents the curse of the law being done away with for the Christian. So when a Christian is baptized, put under the water, represents the curse of the law being done away with in Christ. As the Christian is brought up out of the baptismal waters, it represents putting on new life in Christ. The old system of condemnation and death under the guardianship of the law has been washed away. It's been done away with at Christ's victory over sin and death at the resurrection. And so in the same way that Jesus arose victorious from the grave, when a Christian is raised out of the baptismal waters, it represents the victory that they have in Christ. And so Paul uses this example of baptism as a potent example of our adoption into God's family. Think about that the next time you see uh, a Christian being baptized. What a picture that is of our joining God's family, a picture of the condemnation of the law being done away with in Christ, a picture of being raised to new life with Christ at the resurrection. How incredible is that? So think about that the next time we have a baptism or the next time you, you go see a, a friend or a family member who's accepted Jesus and is being baptized. In verses 28 through 29, Paul talks about the implications of being in Christ, and, and these are pretty big. Um, let me read them again. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female. When you get adopted into God's family, it changes everything about your life. Uh, our churches, the, the way we treat each other, the way we live should look nothing like the world. And so Paul here, he starts talking about some of the implications, and these are truly earth-shattering. They were earth-shattering for the Galatians and for the folks in the first century, and they are just as earth-shattering for us today. So what does Paul mean when he says there's neither Jew nor Greek? Well, this is religious, religion that, uh, that Paul is talking about. And this was a big one for the Galatians, as we've obviously seen all through the book. The Galatians are struggling with legalism, with religiosity. And what the Judaizers were saying was that these Galatians had to put on the trappings of Judaism. They had to uh, be circumcised. They had to keep the feast days. They had to keep kosher and Sabbath and do all these different things in order to be complete Christians. If they didn't do these things, they weren't complete Christians. But in Christ, that old Jewish legal code is no longer necessary. The Galatians did not have to become Jews. And the Jewish Christians, like Peter and Paul and the apostles, could freely fellowship with Gentile Christians. So what Paul is saying is that those barriers that were there before between Jew and Gentile, and these were huge barriers, are broken down. Now Paul can fellowship with the Gentiles. Now Peter can fellowship with the Gentiles. Remember, Paul actually confronted Peter about breaking off fellowship with the Gentiles. And so this was huge because... This wall had stood for thousands of years, and in Christ, it's no more. So Jew and Greek can fellowship together, can join together in worshiping Jesus. And how does this play out for us today? Well, in Galatians, it was all about adding extra requirements 
uh, putting on the external trappings of religion, something that, that looked good. If somebody walks through the door of our church and they look different than us, maybe they got a big old tattoo on their face, and we kind of uh, we kind of shy away because, man, they're different. You know, they've got a, They obviously come from a different background. Maybe there's some from from some crazy city like Portland or Seattle. You know, those crazy people from the Northwest. I tell you what. Um, but they come through our door, and these people love Jesus. Maybe they got some rings in their nose and their uh, eyebrows, but it's obvious. They talk to you and they say, "I love Jesus. I want to serve Him." And if we shy away from them, if we say, no, 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 we don't want to incorporate you into our body, we don't want to uh, disciple you, hold you accountable because you look different, then we're doing the exact same things that these Judaizers did. We're throwing up walls between, uh, between Jesus and them. We're making it about religion, about external appearances, and not about the heart. We're just being self-righteous legalists. Those things, those appearances, they don't have anything to do with the salvation of a person. And so when someone comes through our door and they look different than us, they come from a different background than us, but they love Jesus and they're doctrinally and theologically sound, then we should welcome them into our fellowship with open arms and put them to work. The next one. Slave and free. Now, you might be scratching your head and going, okay, well, I can see how that might have played out in the first century, but what about today? Well, first of all, let's talk about the first century. In ancient Rome, you know, slave trade was just a massive economic engine. People were bought and sold. People groups were captured and and brought into slavery. Some people would even sell themselves into slavery to pay off their debts. But there was a huge economic distinction between a slave and a free man. And so what Paul is saying is that in Christ, those economic distinctions don't matter. When a person is adopted into God's family, it doesn't matter to God if they're a janitor or if they're a millionaire CEO. Um, Think about this. In the early church, there were actually instances of slaves holding positions of authority in the church over free men and over their masters. That's how much Jesus changes things. Slaves taking positions of authority over their masters because in Christ there is no economic distinction. It doesn't matter whether you're rich. It doesn't matter whether you're poor. And in our churches today, we shouldn't give special preference to those who have lots of money and can give a lot uh, versus those who can't give a lot. Because in Christ, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. And so because of this distinction being done away with, because rich and poor and dividing that, making that distinction in the church doesn't matter, we need to make sure that we welcome people into our body who have a lot and we welcome people into our body who have none and that we work to take care of those who have none. Now the next one, male and female. This was another really big issue in the first century, and it is today on a certain, on a different level. Uh, women during this time were basically viewed as subhuman. They essentially had no rights. Uh, if a woman had, was to testify in court, their, um, their testimony was basically viewed as null. They weren't trusted, their word didn't count, They couldn't enter into uh, legally binding agreements. They were essentially viewed as subhuman. But what does Paul say happens in Christ? That distinction doesn't matter. Men and women are equal before Christ. Men are not superior. Women are not superior. Men and women stand equal before Christ. Now, I need to elaborate on this just a little bit because this verse, this specific verse, where Paul says there is no male or female, has been used to advocate uh, sinful sexual lifestyles. That's not what Paul had in mind at all. Paul was clearly drawing a distinction between the, uh, the way women were viewed in first century Rome. 
And he says, in our churches, there is no place for that treatment. Men and women stand equal before God. Now, what does this look like today? You're saying, well, you know, you know thankfully, we don't, we don't struggle with that today. You know, I, I, I see lots of uh, happily married couples in our uh, congregation. Um, you know, women today can go out and enter into legally binding contracts, do, do everything a man can do. But there are still many ways today in which our culture takes advantage of women. Think about the scourge of pornography that is just rampant. Tell me that is not degrading and subhuman to women. Pornography is rampant in our churches too. And so as a body of believers, that is something that we cannot allow in our church. That is something that we cannot allow in our families because Paul says there's not male, there's not female. Men and women are equal before God. But if someone's sitting there and they're looking at pornography on their computers, that is saying that that woman is somehow subhuman and just an object. That doesn't have any place in our church or in our lives. And so if we want to be a, a church where this is played out, then we need to make sure that we are holding each other accountable, that we are not letting ourselves slip when it comes especially to the area of pornography just because it is so rampant, so easily accessible. You know, when I was in high school, you had to have a computer. Now you've got phones. You can get on the internet anytime you want with a phone. And everybody's got a phone these days that can get on the internet, just about. And so you need to hold each other accountable. Spouses, you need to hold each other accountable when it comes to this. Sunday school teachers, you need to hold your class accountable when it comes to this. Don't let this be an issue in our church. And if it is an issue in your life, then you need to repent to God and you need to repent to your spouse if you're married and you need to seek accountability. In verses 4, 1 through 7, Paul goes in and he kind of unpacks this idea of adoption. And so we've talked about the implications of being adopted into God's family. Obviously, there are huge implications. They were huge in the first century, and they are huge today. Our churches should look nothing like the culture. And if they do, then we're failing. But here Paul talks about some of the wonderful things that we get when we're adopted into God's family. Uh, first of all, in verses 1 through 3, if you read that, you probably notice that it sounds a lot like what we talked about last week. Paul kind of uh, restates what he said last week about the law. Um, back in verses chapter 3, verses 23 through 25. But there's something specific here that I want to draw our attention to rather than rehashing what we talked about last week. Notice how Paul says the Galatians were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. What do you think that means? Well, in this time, there was a, a common a religious view, a common way of looking at the world among uh, the Gentiles, among the Greeks, and they viewed the world as being composed of four elements, earth, air, water, and fire. Those were the four elements that made up all of the known universe. And in some cases, these elements were deified. Uh, some of you might recognize some of these names. Hephaestus, Hera, Poseidon, Demeter. These were Greek, uh, members of the Greek pantheon, these false gods. And so when Paul tells a Gentile audience um, about being enslaved to elementary principles, they would have read that and they would have nodded their head and go, I, I know exactly what Paul's talking about. He's talking about being enslaved to that false pagan religion before. And so Paul says to the Galatians, you were once enslaved to these false principles, worshiping uh, these false deities, and now you've gone on to maturity in Christ. Well, what about, uh, what about legalism and Judaism? Paul was addressing that too. Well, when a Jewish person would read this, they would have, a, a Jewish person who is a Christian would read this, they would have thought back to their time when they lived under the law. And what was essentially a, a uh, now that we have Christ, a superstitious view of the law in that you could somehow earn your salvation or make yourself appear better to God by keeping the law. 
And so Paul says, you Galatians have left behind these elementary principles. You've been adopted into God's family, and now you've moved on to maturity, and you get the benefits of being adopted into God's family instead of being just like an immature little kid over here. And, you know, that's basically what these Galatians were doing when they were trying to stick one foot back into legalism and have one foot adopted into God's family. They're saying, I want to keep being this immature little kid, uh, doing things my own way, uh, making myself feel good about things, even though it's immature. I don't know about you, but if you walk into somebody's house and you see a 25-year-old guy sitting in a recliner eating Cheetos and playing video games while his mom serves him Dr. Pepper, that's not very attractive. You want to tell the kid to go get a job and make a life. And so Paul says, why would you, why would you go back to, to that when you can have this wonderful, beautiful fellowship uh, of being adopted into God's family? Don't go, to Im- don't go back to immaturity. You have maturity here with Christ. That's what you want. In verses 4 through 5, uh, Paul men- makes this interesting observation. You notice how he says, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son. What an interesting way to phrase that. What does he mean when the fullness of time had come? Well, think about the first century. I mean, compared to now, it was obviously pretty primitive. But compared to what had come before the uh, Greek and Roman culture, this was incredibly advanced. Uh, When Alexander the Great came on the scene uh, several hundred years before Christ and went around and and conquered a huge chunk of the known world, he brought with him a common language and a common culture. And then when the Romans come on the scene, they conquer even more of the world and they bring with them roads. They bring with them uh, security and all these different things. And so when Christ comes, the fullness of time was there because the message of the gospel was able to spread, because the roads were there, because there was security, uh, because there was a common language and a common culture. And so when Paul says the fullness of time, he means that God's perfect timing was at play right there when the law was fulfilled and Jesus redeemed us. Now, in verses 5 through 7, some of the most interesting words, I think, in the Bible. Paul says, to redeem those who are under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father, so you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. Adoption. Have you ever thought about what an incredible picture that is of God's love and of the salvation story? Have you ever thought about how when two parents adopt a child, what an incredible picture that is of this? There's a reason why Paul used that word. But what about this this word, Abba, Father, that Paul mentions here? Every time I read this, I I, I stop and I I look at it and and I think about it. Because what Paul is saying is that since we have been adopted into God's family, since Jesus saved us and made us a part of God's family, we can now cry out to God, Abba, Father. So, so what's the significance of that? Well, the term Abba, the, the, uh, an Aramaic word, and if you, you can tell just by reading it, Abba. Liam says that all the time, Abba, Abba, Abba. It was one of the first sounds that a baby would make. <clears throat> and so it was the, a term that implied this, this deep familial connection and intimacy, a, a, a strong, uh, loving, mature relationship. So when Paul says that the Holy Spirit cries out within us, Abba, Father, he is saying that we now have a rich and a deep 
and a familial connection to God. How incredible is that, church? We're adopted into God's family, and He is now our perfect Father. Because of this adoption, we can now approach God, the creator of the universe, and we can say to Him, Daddy, I love you. Daddy, I need you. Daddy, I hurt. How incredible is that, church? Because of Jesus and our adoption into this beautiful family of faith, we get to call the God of the universe, Abba, Father, Daddy. So remember that the next time you pray over a meal, on your way to work, and you pray, Father, the significance of that, because you as a Christian are adopted into God's family, and you get to call the almighty creator of the universe, Father. That's pretty amazing, church.